Many jobs require the application of large forces. The energy needed to exert these forces via equipment and machinery is usually supplied by motors. But the energy provided by a drive unit is often in a form not suitable for directly powering the working elements. This diesel drive shaft, for example, can't operate the dumper directly. An electric motor can't directly operate this press. The energy must first be converted into a usable form and then, of course, transmitted to the working location. That, for example, is what hydraulics does when it uses a fluid as a medium for transmitting force and controlling movement. Several physical properties of fluids make this possible. Here are the most important advantages of hydraulics. A considerable force can be transmitted in carefully measured amounts, as with this press. Hydraulic drives have a very good performance to weight ratio, which is an advantage in mobile systems. So things can be positioned very precisely, which is very important in the case of elevators or lifts. Hydraulic motion is uniform, and speeds are variable. As in this sawing machine, in which the advanced stroke is slower than the return stroke. Hydraulic systems can be started up under maximum load. This is important, for example, in platform lifts. Effective overload protection is also easy to implement. Two forms of hydraulics are available, depending on the application. Stationary hydraulics is used in stationary systems and machinery. Mobile hydraulics is used in construction, vehicles and aircraft. But the physical laws involved are the same in both forms. Pressure fluid in hydraulic systems has several functions. It must transmit pressure energy. And it must also serve as a lubricant for moving parts in the system, while at the same time protecting metal parts from corrosion. It must dissipate the heat generated by the friction of the oil flow. And finally, the pressure fluid carries away abraded particles from the surface of moving parts, which are then collected in a filter. Fluids have various properties that must be taken into consideration when they are used under pressure. Water is very thin, so we say that it has a low viscosity. It provides no protection against corrosion and has almost no lubricating properties. This means that if it is not part of a mixture, it is not suitable as a hydraulic fluid. In general, mineral or synthetic oils are used in hydraulic systems. This is an oil with low viscosity. 
And here we have an oil with high viscosity, or in other words, a viscous oil. Additives can change the physical properties of hydraulic oils. So by adding substances to oil, it can be made suitable for a particular hydraulic application. Incidentally, unlike air, hydraulic oils can be compressed only minimally, about 7% by volume. That's one of the reasons why hydraulic systems can work so precisely. The pressure in a hydraulic system determines the system's work output. This pressure is created when a force is applied to a surface. The formula for this is Pressure P equals force F divided by area A. If pressure is applied to a fluid in a closed system, the same pressure is present at every point in the system. Or in other words, the fluid is under the same amount of pressure everywhere in the system. This phenomenon was discovered in the 17th century by Blaise Pascal and formulated in what is called Pascal's Law. An experiment will demonstrate this. The same pressure is present in all of these tubes, as we can see by the height of the fluid level. What this means in actual practice is that the force applied to any point in the hydraulic system can be used at any other point, because the force is propagated evenly within the entire system. In effect, the fluid acts like a mechanical piston rod. The operating speed in the hydraulic system is determined by the flow rate. This is the amount of fluid that flows through a line per unit of time. Or expressed as a formula, flow rate Q equals volume V divided by time T. If it takes about 10 seconds to fill this 2 liter container, then the flow rate is 12 liters per minute, or 0.2 liters per second. If we assume a flow rate here of 2 liters, and the volume on the piston side of the cylinder is 160 cubic centimeters, then it will take approximately 5 seconds for the cylinder chamber to fill up completely with hydraulic fluid and advance the piston. At a rate of 4 liters per minute, the piston advances at twice the speed. This is how the operating speed of a hydraulic system is controlled. We've seen how the propagation of pressure in a closed system can transmit force. On effective surface areas of equal size, for example equal piston diameters, the effect of force on the left is exactly equal to the force on the right. When equal weights are used in our experiment, we achieve a balance of force. But if the ratio of the effective surface areas is, for example, 1 to 3, 3 times the load on the right can be supported. Once again, we have a state of balance. Thus, in a hydraulic system, force can be transmitted or stepped down. The same applies to displacement. Here we have equal piston surface areas in both cylinders. When the piston on the left travels a certain distance downward, the right-hand piston rises by the same distance. But if the right-hand piston has three times the surface area, it travels only a third of the distance of the left piston. 
This way, large masses can be moved with comparatively little exertion of force, as in the case of this hydraulic jack. On the one side, we have low force with high displacement, while on the load side, we have a large load with small displacement. The pressure in hydraulic systems can also be transmitted. In our example, a pressure of 50 bar is applied to the left side of the cylinder. This exerts a force which, of course, also acts on the right side. But since the piston surface on the right side is only about half as large, which we'll discuss in just a moment, the resulting pressure is approximately twice as high, that is, about 90 bar. In actual practice, pressure transmission is used when high pressure is required only at individual points in the system. For example, at a clamping cylinder like this one. This can eliminate the need for an expensive high pressure system. Different points within a hydraulic system have different cross sections. But because flow rate is the same throughout the system, flow velocity is higher through narrow passages. At flow velocities of less than 4 to 6 meters per second, the fluid flows evenly, although slightly faster in the center of the pipe than along the walls. This is called laminar flow. In a narrow passage, called a throttle, flow velocity is higher. This causes turbulence and loss of pressure. The higher the flow velocity, the lower the pressure. Our experiment shows this clearly. The lowest water column is over the narrow passage in the middle tube, which means that pressure is lowest at this point. In extreme cases, pressure can drop so drastically that it creates a partial vacuum. This causes bubbles to form from air dissolved in the hydraulic oil. The sudden rise in pressure that occurs when the passage widens again causes the bubbles to collapse, tearing out tiny particles from the material at the transition point. This in turn causes material fatigue or even breakdown. This effect is called cavitation. In practice, these phenomena occur primarily in the bores of components and at the control edges of valves every place where there is a change in cross-section. The sudden compression of the gas bubbles when pressure rises again causes high temperatures. If these temperatures exceed 830 degrees centigrade, it can cause spontaneous combustion, as happens in a diesel engine. This leads then to small shock waves throughout the system and premature aging of the hydraulic oil. Dimensioning a hydraulic system adequately can lessen the effect of all these negative occurrences. A hydraulic system gets its energy from an external source. For this jack, the source can be a person. Or for this platform lift, it can be an electric motor. Let's stay with the platform lift as an example. A gear pump transforms the energy from the electric motor into hydraulic energy. The transmitting medium for this energy is the hydraulic oil. The actual working component, the plunger of the platform lift, is the piston of a hydraulic cylinder. But for all this to work, a hydraulic system needs a so-called power control section. This component is made up of valves, valves with differing functions. This simple system clearly illustrates system design. The power supply unit, the power control section, 
and the drive unit. In the power supply unit, mechanical energy is converted into hydraulic energy and the hydraulic fluid is conditioned. The main components in this unit are the drive motor, the safety valve, the oil reservoir, and the pump. This is an external gear pump. It creates a continuous flow of fluid. And this is how that's done. The suction chamber is connected to the oil reservoir. When the two gear wheels turn, the volume of the chamber increases slightly whenever a tooth leaves a gap. This creates a partial vacuum in the suction chamber, which then causes the oil to be drawn out of the reservoir. Oil is transported between the gear teeth along the chamber walls to the pressure chamber. The intermeshing teeth prevent the oil in the middle from flowing back. The oil now flows from the pressure chamber into the line, where it is displaced by the oil being supplied continually from the gear wheels. Initially, the pump doesn't create pressure, but only a fluid flow. Not until the fluid meets with resistance, for example, line resistance or a load, as in the case of our platform lift, does hydraulic pressure build up. When pressure is higher than the resistance of the workload, the piston begins to advance until it reaches its end position. If the pump continues to supply fluid and pressure continues to rise, something will eventually have to give. Either the line will burst, or the pump or cylinder will be damaged. This is prevented by a pressure relief valve, which is set to the maximum pressure of the pump. It doesn't open until this pressure has been reached, at which time it channels the hydraulic oil back to the reservoir. It's usually combined with a pressure gauge to form a unit. This external gear pump generates a constant flow rate. So what we have here is a constant action pump system. The oil reservoir in a hydraulic system has several functions. First of all, it holds the oil supply for the system and takes up the unpressurized oil flowing back from the system, which it then cools. But also, suspended matter, water, and air must be removed from the oil. In order for the oil to remain in the reservoir long enough for this to be achieved, the reservoir must have a large enough capacity. Before the oil leaves the reservoir and returns into the system, it flows through a filter that traps any remaining impurities. About 70% of all malfunctions in hydraulic systems are due to impurities in the oil. This is why it's so important to service the filter unit regularly. Incidentally, there are filters in the suction line, or in pressure lines, or in the return line. hydraulic drive units which convert hydraulic energy into linear motion. These are the cylinders. Rotary drives, or as they are also called, hydraulic motors, generate rotary motion. Let's look first at hydraulic cylinders. The single acting cylinder. This is a single acting cylinder and its circuit symbol. It has one port for a working line. And this is how it works. When oil flows into the chamber, working pressure builds up and the piston advances. The cylinder can do work in only one direction. 
Even when oil pressure drops, nothing happens. The piston doesn't retract until an external force is applied. Incidentally, the piston doesn't seal off the two cylinder chambers from each other 100%. This is why over time some oil does get into the unpressurized chamber. This oil then flows back to the reservoir via a leakage oil line. Here we see a single acting cylinder in a scissor type elevating platform. The return stroke is powered by an external force, in this case the weight of the platform. But there are also single acting cylinders with spring return. This cylinder, which creates contact pressure as it advances, is returned by a spring. The single acting cylinder in this scissor type elevating platform is a so-called plunger cylinder. Here the piston and rod diameters are the same. This design is extremely bend resistant, which makes it particularly suitable for moving heavy loads. This is why plunger cylinders are often used in platform lifts. The double acting cylinder. The double acting cylinder can be recognized by its two working ports. This is how it works. Pressure is applied to both sides alternately to advance and retract the piston. This means that the cylinder can do work in both directions. It can push and pull. The cylinder retracts faster than it advances. Just why is that? Well, here we can see why. The chamber on the rod side is smaller. With the rod further reducing the effective rod surface area. In actual practice, cylinders are often used in which the ratio of the two piston surfaces, and thus of the chamber volumes, is precisely set at 2 to 1. Such cylinders are called differential cylinders. From this we can derive the following. If force F1 equals P times A, and force F2 equal P times A over 2, then the force on the return stroke is equal to half that of the advance stroke. On the other hand, the flow rate being equal, half the chamber volume on the rod side is filled with oil in half the time, so the piston retracts at twice the speed. The flow rate of the discharged oil is also twice as high, because double the amount of oil must be discharged in the same time. This causes back pressure to develop. These laws must be taken into consideration when choosing hydraulic cylinders. In this special cylinder for a press, the piston rod has almost the same diameter as the piston, making the difference between the two piston surface areas extreme. This means that a slow flow rate is sufficient for a relatively fast retraction of the piston. Varying piston speeds would be undesirable in this hydraulic steering mechanism, because steering movements to the right and left must be at the same speed. For this reason, a balanced cylinder was used in this case. A balanced cylinder is one with a double-ended piston rod. An additional advantage of a rod like this is that it can move elements on both sides. A hydraulic cylinder with a long stroke and a relatively short length is the telescopic cylinder, which comes both as a single-acting and a double-acting cylinder. And now to hydraulic motors. Basically, they function just like hydraulic pumps, only the other way around. The hydraulic oil, which is under pressure, drives two intermeshing gear wheels. 
it flows along the chamber wall and becomes almost unpressurized because it only has to overcome line resistance as far as the oil reservoir. An important characteristic of hydraulic motors is the consumed volume V. This is the quantity of oil that the motor can take in in one revolution. Rotational speed N is calculated from flow rate divided by consumed volume. Any calculations of hydraulic systems must always make allowances for leakage oil loss. This hydraulic motor, which drives the trolley of a gantry crane, converts hydraulic energy into mechanical energy in the form of rotary motion. In the chapter Designing a Hydraulic System, we saw that between the power supply unit and the drive unit, the power control section makes sure that the system actually performs the functions for which it was designed. Valves are the components in the system that control the energy flow, that is, the oil flow. This makes them a kind of interface between power supply and the drive unit. They open the flow path or they close it. They direct the oil flow. They regulate flow rate and oil pressure. Valves come in the form of poppet valves, and slide valves. In poppet valves, a sphere or cone is pressed onto the valve seat, closing off the flow passage. Poppet valves are tight sealing and designed mainly as two- and three-way valves. In slide valves, pistons open or close flow paths by moving back and forth, thus sealing off or opening bores. The piston needs a certain amount of tolerance, which is why this type of valve doesn't seal as tightly as poppet valves, so they're only used for pressure of up to 315 bar. Slide valves can open or close several flow paths at once. There are various ways of actuating hydraulic valves. Manually by lever. or by foot pedal, mechanically by roller lever, or by spring, or electrically, as in the case of these solenoid valves. The function of directional control valves is to control the flow path of the hydraulic oil. This is a two-two-way valve with its circuit symbol. It has two ports and two switching positions, which is where it gets its name. And this is how it works. In one of the two switching positions, the flow of hydraulic oil is blocked. In the other, it's opened.
For example, a two two-way valve is used in this elevating platform. It opens the connection between the single acting cylinder and the tank. The external load can then return the cylinder piston to the lower end position. As its name says, a three two-way valve also has two switching positions but three ports. For example, one to the pump, one to the drive unit, and one to the reservoir. In this valve, the port to the pump is blocked when the valve is in its normal position. When the valve is actuated, the hydraulic oil can flow to the cylinder. The piston advances. When the valve is released, the flow of oil is stopped. In our example, an external force presses the piston back into its retracted end position and the hydraulic oil to the reservoir, because the port to the reservoir is now open. Here's a practical example. If the three two-way valve is reversed, oil can flow from the single acting cylinder, in this case the plunger of the platform lift, to the tank. The cylinder retracts. This is a four two-way valve, a valve with four ports and two switching positions. An additional working port has been added here. Depending on the switching position, a four two-way valve directs the flow of pressure oil to one of the two working ports. This means that this valve can be used, for example, to control a double acting cylinder. In this switching position, the hydraulic oil is directed to the left-hand chamber and the piston advances. The oil from the right-hand chamber flows via the four two-way valve to the tank. If the valve is reversed, both flow paths for the oil are reversed. The piston retracts again. In this switching position, the cylinder is advanced when the valve is in its normal position. When the valve is actuated, the cylinder retracts. That's the case here, for example. when the excavator shovel is opened. With this four two-way valve, it's just the other way around. In its normal position, the cylinder is retracted. When it's actuated, the cylinder advances. This valve differs from the four two-way valve in that it has three switching positions. It's a four three-way valve. When this valve is in the mid position, all of the ports are blocked, which means it has a positive piston overlap. This term describes what happens when the valve piston is in the mid position. With this valve, the motion of the piston can be stopped or reversed at any point. It can also stop a hydraulic motor and, of course, change its direction of rotation. This is the circuit symbol for a four three-way valve with positive piston overlap. With this four three-way valve, we have a negative piston overlap. As we can see, the supply and exhaust ports are not closed by the pilot piston in the mid position. All lines are interconnected.
Negative piston overlap like this is needed, for example, when the piston of a double acting cylinder is to be moved by an external force. This only works because the left and right hand chambers of the piston are almost completely unpressurized. We can also have positive and negative piston overlap within one multi-position valve. The combination used is determined by the application. In the valve represented by this circuit symbol, the function has the same effect on the drive units. It stops them. But the pressure port to the pump and the reservoir return line are connected. This means that when the four three-way valve is in the mid position, the pump doesn't have to build up any system pressure. This experiment illustrates another characteristic of directional control valves, switching overlap. This characteristic determines how a valve will behave during switching. Here we have a valve with positive switching overlap, which means that during the transition from one switching position to the other, the ports remain blocked and are not opened until the end position has been reached. This has the effect of maintaining system pressure during the switching process, so that a drive under load does not momentarily sink. The drive unit starts abruptly. The circuit symbol shows this clearly. Switching overlap is noted to the right and left of mid position in the broken line box. And here the ports are closed. The case is different with negative switching overlap. During the switching process, all ports are briefly connected with each other. We've already mentioned that in a double acting cylinder with a ratio of approximately 2 to 1 between the effective piston surface areas, the piston retracts almost twice as fast as it advances, but providing only about half the force. To make advance and retraction the same, a three two-way valve can be used to set up a differential circuit. The line to the piston rod chamber is not connected to the valve, as is normally the case, but is connected to the pressure line between the pump and valve. As we can see, this means that the rod side is always under full system pressure. When the valve is actuated, the pump builds up pressure in the left-hand chamber as well. The piston moves because the effective piston surface area on this side is larger than on the other. This causes additional oil to be pushed from the right-hand chamber into the left. So we get a higher flow rate, consisting of the pump delivery and the recirculated oil. Since both have the same flow rate, the piston advances at twice the speed, making advance and return speed the same but only with half the force. This is a differential circuit with a four three-way valve and mid-position bypass. In this switching position, the piston retracts rapidly. The first phase of advance is also rapid, because this is where the differential circuit takes effect. In the second phase, the piston continues to advance, but only half as fast. In practice, this means that a tool can advance rapidly, do its work slowly, and retract rapidly. This shortens machine cycle times.
Non-return valves permit oil flow in only one direction, blocking flow in the opposite direction. Because of the tighter seal of this valve design, non-return valves are always constructed as poppet valves. The shutoff element can be free or spring-loaded. When oil begins to move in the direction of flow, the cone is pushed off its seat and the oil passage opened. Any flow in the opposite direction causes the valve to close. A non-return valve can have the job of holding a load in position. This means that leakage oil losses, which usually cannot be avoided in directional control valves, have no effect on the cylinder. If a platform lift, for example, is in the advanced position, a non-return valve prevents the piston from gradually retracting. But when the piston is to retract, the non-return valve must, of course, release the block. In a non-return valve with unlockable function, the non-return valve initially blocks the line in one direction. When the valve is to be released, the seat is lifted hydraulically via a control line and the working line is open for the return flow of the oil. Pressure valves control and regulate the hydraulic oil pressure in a complete system or individual sections. There are two types of pressure valve, the pressure relief valve and the pressure regulator. A pressure relief valve prevents oil pressure from exceeding a predefined limit. And this is how it functions. As pressure approaches the preset maximum value, the valve begins to open and some of the oil flows back to the reservoir. When the preset pressure, that is, the maximum system pressure, is reached, all of the oil flows back to the reservoir. This prevents pressure from rising any further. If pressure drops, for example because a directional control valve has reversed its direction, the pressure relief valve closes again. Every hydraulic system is protected by at least one pressure relief valve. Just one more word about pressure conditions in hydraulic systems. We have two basic situations. First, there is the dynamic situation. Here, for example, the highest pressure set at the pressure relief valve cannot be used as transmission or working pressure to move a load. The reason is that when the oil flows through valves and pipelines, there could be a loss of pressure. The loss can be as high as 25%. However, a dynamic situation can end up as the other type of situation, the static situation, when the piston of a cylinder has reached its end position. This means that the system reaches its highest power consumption when the actual work, in this case lifting, has been completed. But in a static situation, a hydraulic system can achieve its greatest force because in this case, for example for clamping, the pressure set at the pressure relief valve can be most fully effective. The pressure regulator. If a system has two drive units that are to exert different amounts of force and thus require different pressures, a pressure regulator can limit the pressure for one drive to a lower value. The pressure at the valve output acts on a pilot piston. 
When pressure rises, the pilot piston is moved against the force of the spring shortly before it reaches the set value. Under certain conditions, this could happen while the piston is still moving in the cylinder. When the piston has reached its end position, the pressure continues to rise. This has the effect of the pilot piston closing off the pressure line completely, making it impossible to exceed the value set at the pressure regulator. This is a two-way pressure regulator. Its job is to limit the clamping pressure of this drill chuck to a predetermined value. If we were to use a two-way pressure regulator in this machine, changes in pressure would occur during the cutting of the thread. This, of course, would not be desirable. So we combine the function of a two-way pressure regulator with that of a pressure relief valve to form a three-way pressure regulator that keeps pressure constant during the work process. Pressure peaks from the system cause the pilot piston of the three-way pressure regulator to open the working line to the reservoir. This relieves any excess pressure and the preset maximum pressure is not exceeded. Flow control valves, in conjunction with the pressure relief valve, control the working speed of hydraulic drive units. This combination controls the flow rate, which is the decisive factor in setting working speed. Constant action pumps then supply a uniform flow rate. This means that a reduction of the cross-section alone would only lead to an undesirable increase in the speed of flow and, of course, to an increase in pressure upstream of the throttle point. But the flow rate remains unchanged. Here we see the working speed of the cylinder with the flow control valve open. If the restrictor causes an increase in resistance, the pressure rises prior to this. The pressure relief valve begins to open, which causes the fluid flow to be divided. One part flows to the cylinder, the other back to the reservoir. The slower flow rate now in effect reduces the working speed. Here we see yet another effect of the flow control valve. The greater the load, the slower the advance. A circuit that is not load dependent can be constructed with a flow control valve. A flow control valve consists of an adjustable restrictor and a regulating restrictor. The desired flow rate, and with it the desired piston speed, is set at the adjustable restrictor. As the load increases on the output side, the pressure there rises. This pressure acts together with the spring on the regulating restrictor, which then opens, compensating for the increased resistance. When this happens, the increased output pressure does not affect the pressure relief valve, which would result in an undesirable change in flow rate. Here's an example. Preliminary turning must not be load dependent since an uneven advance would cause uneven machining. The two-way flow control valve provides a uniform advance speed.
there are two ways to control the flow rate. Here we see control of oil supply. Restricting the flow in the supply line for advancing the piston causes the oil to heat up. But warm oil reduces the precision of piston motion in the cylinder. In some machines this is not important, but this machining complex requires greatest precision so that any rise in oil temperature is undesirable. So in a case like this, it's better to restrict the flow in the exhaust line. By this we mean that the flow of oil to the reservoir is restricted, because it doesn't matter if the oil heats up. At the same time, the cylinder piston is hydraulically clamped. But remember that the surface area ratio between the piston sides causes a transmission of pressure to take place. So the system must be suitable for the resulting high pressure. No matter how simple or complex a hydraulic system is, the principle is always the same. The power supply unit converts other forms of energy into hydraulic energy, creates the pump delivery flow, and conditions the hydraulic oil. This is how that looks when represented with circuit diagram symbols. Starting on the left, the pressure gauge, and beneath it the pressure relief valve that has been set to the nominal pump pressure, and the pump with motor and filter. Beneath that is the tank. At the top is the adjustable pressure relief valve for system pressure. Here is a simplified diagram of power supply and pressure relief valve for system pressure together with reservoir. In the power control section, the energy medium, that is the hydraulic oil, is controlled according to the functions of the individual system parts. Direction of flow, pressure, flow rate. These are the jobs performed by valves. Directional control valves, pressure valves, flow control valves, and non-return valves. And this is a representation of a power control section in a circuit diagram. As you can see, the return lines to the tank are indicated by a symbol at the appropriate valve, but not fully drawn. Finally, we have the drive unit, where the actual work is done. But what we have here basically is another energy conversion, from hydraulic energy into mechanical energy. With the drive unit, our circuit diagram is complete. It provides precise information on the design and function of the system, just as clearly and simply for a complex system as for a simple one. The advantages of hydraulics, which include high force, precision, accurate controllability, and adjustability of force and speed, just to mention a few, make it especially well suited for use in many areas of modern technology.